Hello, travelers. Uh, before we start, I wanted to thank again uh, Hubert and Yossi and, and Steffi for this extraordinary uh, situation of an ever-evolving panel over 10 years, because I think it's really wonderful that the R panel here um, has grown and evolved and changed over 10 years. And obviously, uh, in this situation, you know, it's uh, every year answering the year before and, and so on. So when two years ago we talked about post-internet art and the big question, if Rihanna killed post-internet art, it led then last year to the 89 plus uh, panel. And it was actually after the 89 plus panel that we had a long conversation uh, with Kevin McGarry, where Kevin said that it could be a really urgent topic to pick up from the 89 plus panel and further somehow explore is this question of the preset and the postset. It actually was a great uh, uh, see we're into the panel because um, Ryan mentioned that sort of preset post that topic in his unrealized project. It's something artists very often tell us that they have a desire to explore. So we thought nothing could be better to conclude, conclude today's um, program and to conclude actually the art session and to have here a panel bringing together technologists and artists. So we're very happy to have here with us, of course, Ryan again, then uh, Solomon Chase and David Toro of this, Bernd Radig. Joel Hicking, Peter Arval, and also Jason Vishno, whom you met already before uh, with John Brockman. And uh, uh, it's been a wonderful process to conceive this panel with Kevin. We've had many, many uh, conversations. Kevin uh, is a great writer, also curator, uh, was a participant last year in 89 Plus, and he will now give us an introduction uh, to the panel. A very warm welcome to Kevin McGarry. So um, presets are something that Ryan Tricartan has talked a lot about in conjunction with his own work. And as Hans Olish was saying, the idea for this panel about presets came to me last year during DLD, thinking about it as an overlap between his movies and the work of New York-based collective DIS. Um, the two of them happen to be longtime friends and oop, collaborators, uh, and I've been uh, very interested in, in involved in their work, contextualizing it and collaborating in other ways. Um, they're sort of concrete utilitarian presets like Instagram filters and iPhone ringers, uh, as well as more abstract culturally, uh, culturally encoded ones, uh, like the attitudes of corporate professionalism, or even like Jason was saying earlier, uh, the aesthetics of uh, TED Talks behaviors could be thought of as another type of preset that someone could adopt. Um, either way, they're standardizations that are designed to facilitate customization, which in and of itself is sort of a paradox. Uh, and I think frequently paradoxes like that uh, and the tension that they bring, uh, tension between sort of rigidity and creativity, is exactly why there's a poetic potential there. Uh, and I think that's what these artists are tapping into. Um, the notion of the post set is a horizon that Steffi brought to our attention and we'll discover uh, soon in life, maybe as soon as in the next hour, if this is a horizon that truly exists or if it's more of a, a figurative one. The idea of a, a generation beyond presets that uh, allows for more of an actual infinite uh, customization of content. So we have a... Uh, I don't, maybe we should begin by just introducing everyone uh, and doing some individual presentations. Yeah, that's a good idea. So we'll have short presentations by all our speakers and then an open conversation, you know, and can open it also to all of your questions about the presets and the postsets. And so it is very important what Kevin said, that we have to credit Steffi Czerny for this neologism of the postset. And uh, we'll hopefully in the discussion later also have Steffi tell us a little bit more about uh, her you know, idea of the post -side. I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker, uh, Peter Arwai, who is actually uh, the CEO on the, and the co-founder of Prezi. Prezi needs no introduction uh, here at DLD. Uh, and as Peter often says, he loves technologies that tell world-changing stories. Before joining Prezi, he had established Onward.se, uh, which helps patients to compare treatments between hospital and incredibly useful toolbox. He was also part of creating the world's first mobile newsreader, the great pioneer of many technologies. A very, very warm welcome to Peter Arbeit. 
Thank you, Hans. Thank you. And connecting back to Ryan's talk, Ryan was talking about, you know, how he wished to edit space. Well, that's essentially what we are doing at Prezi. And rather than starting with my presentation, I actually thought I would just do some live demos from our website. So what you see right now is actually a presentation that I pulled today uh, from our website, uh, from our website. And this is a Prezi for those of you, hello. Who, for those of you who haven't seen a Prezi, this is what it looks like. It enables people to really think about spaces and stories in a very different way. Because by showing the big picture, you can actually understand the details. And it actually helps people to both understand and remember um, people's ideas in much more efficient ways um, than if we were to put these just on a page. So this particular Prezi was done by MIT students who are thinking about how to standardize connecting um, devices. And, um, and, and they are doing this with the help of cars in this example, but they're working on a standardized way of, of doing that. And Really what I pulled this from is our Explore page. Uh, if you click on this tab called Explore on Prezi.com, you can actually find over 100 million public Prezi's today. And even Hans, why don't we... Uh, let's see. Ooh. Am I spelling right? Let's see what we find if we search on your name. Of over a thousand prizes, at least one there, I think, is naming you, right? <laughs> um, and, and it's a really great place where you can find uh, inspiration, irrespective of the, of, of the stories you want to tell. And, and one of the things uh, you might wonder is, what are the benefits of rethinking the format or the way you are actually sharing your stories? Well. Um, we have just started to learn about this ourselves, actually, and it's very much through science. So let's do an experiment here. If I were to ask you guys right now to tell me what kitchen appliances you have, think about that for a few seconds. What kitchen appliances do you have? And Hans, maybe you could tell me. Yeah. No, I've got non-kitchen appliances. You know, I uh, never made even a coffee. I go for coffee to a restaurant in the morning, and that's why I became a curator, because I did, you know, you my kitchen needed kitchen. for use, then Shoot. I did a kitchen show, so I've got none. Okay. This is the first time this example has failed on me. <laughs> Do you have a kitchen? Vitamix. Okay, great. Vit uh, Vitamix. Vitamix. Yeah? What else do you have in your kitchen? Uh, to toaster oven. Uh-huh. And teapot. Uh-huh. And microwave, stove, right. refrigerator. Right. That's it. So I guess what you just did right now is you imagined your kitchen, you zoomed onto the counter, and then you named the things as you saw them in your kitchen, right? Now, what you didn't do turns out to be equally important. You didn't build a list of words, neither bullet-pointed or alphabetized, right? And there's, there's actually a reason for that, and that's what we've kind of been learning about in the last few uh, years here with working on Prezi. So for the last few millions of years, your brain has really evolved to make your way out of a cave, find some berries, and find your way back to survive, right? But that had to be stored in a very special format, so cognitive scientists call this landmarks. And, and landmarks have this unique property where there's an object recognition happening, like a tree that you turn left by, but also how the tree is spatially arranged compared to the berries and your cave, right? And when you activate these two large centers of your brain, visual comprehension and spatial recognition, you tend to remember and understand things better ways. And, and we have accidentally bumped into this with Prezi as well, because uh, we have found a way for you as a presenter, but also for audiences to trigger 
these centers of, of the brain. So let's say you're a startup entrepreneur and you want to do a pitch. Well, you can do that by essentially telling the story of climbing a mountain, right? So you start with a group of people and then you have to avoid some risks and take on some really big challenge. And then if you reach the top of the mountain, you can, of course, change the world. And you can see how remarkably similar you know, these visual landmarks and prezies are, and that's what we've come to realize, actually, is one of the driving factors of, of reframing stories spatially, talking about spatial editing, is actually one of those things that help people to both understand and, and remember stories better. Um, and based on this, we've been growing very fast. So we've been doubling uh, our company numbers every year. Uh, today, we have 36 million people who have started using Prezi. And uh, a year ago, it was 15. And uh, we have 200 employees working in our offices in Budapest, San Francisco, and in Korea. And we've been cash flow positive since year one. So what we're doing is to help people to express their stories in, in more creative and more open ways. Uh, thank you. So um, next we have Solomon Chase and David Toro, who are here from Disc Magazine. Um, this is a four-person art collective based in New York City. The other members are uh, Lauren Boyle and Marco Rosso. Uh, it's a collective that exists through a number of cultural interventions that manifest across a range of media and platforms, most notably this magazine, which is a digital art and culture publication that exists online, uh, this images, which is a project that we'll be talking about here today, and, and excitingly, uh, a real world project will be coming to New York in March, uh, this own, which is a uh, store that will operate for a number of weeks. Uh, this is commissioned artists to make consumer products and we'll be selling them in Manhattan. Cool. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Hans. Um, I'm actually going to present on the podium over here. I don't know if I need both mics. It is. Can I plug it in? Oh, I think I'm okay. Okay, um, so yeah, as Kevin said, um, this is a New York-based collective, and um, I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to be focusing on our appropriation and application of um, the codes and presets of um, commercial photography. Um, so, this is cultural um, interventions manifest across a range of media and platforms. Um, as Kevin mentioned, this magazine, which was founded in 2010 um, as a digital platform that examines art, fashion, music, and culture, um, constructing and supporting new creative practices. Um, this is where ideas, value systems, and everything else um, is not overtly analyzed or critiqued, but is represented in its most heightened configuration. Um, I, we're going to focus on Dis Images, um, which is a fully functioning stock image site um, that enlists artists to create leasable pictures and video. Um, Dis Images is dedicated to manipulating the codes and trends in stock photography. We've always been attracted to the weirdness and ubiquity um, of stock photographs, um, the generic homogenous banality and also the hyper-specificity that happens when you mix too many tags together. Um, for us, it's a way of negotiating with things that make us uncomfortable. Um, in the history of stock, there's been um, kind of a transition from highly specialized um, and more rare or expensive to um, the amateur and a vast abundance of stock imagery, um, making it very redundant and oversaturated um, and overpowering every image search. Um, our first uh, ventures into the medium uh, began through looking at new ways of documenting art 
um, in an attention economy. Um, this is from an exhibition at the New Museum. The show is called Free. Um, we casted, we, it was the whole museum, we casted um, kind of fictional museum goers and, um, and we mixed them in with the actual curators, guards, interns, and staff of the museum and kind of created a stock um, of the museum experience in a real exhibition. Um, this, is, this was a story that we did called Competing Images, which was shot in an exhibition of Katya Noviskova and Timur Sikin that was curated by Agatha Wara. Um, we were interested in seeing what happens to art, um, what happens to the documentation, sorry, uh, what happens to the documentation of art um, when it includes the visitors and bystanders who gather to engage and reflect and who themselves have a multitude of concerns and distractions and agendas. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, um, uh, we did this commercial project for the brand Kenzo and when tasked with that, we decided to kind of push the branded propaganda um, of editorialized advertising or a fashion video and um, with extreme promotionalism. So we applied um, a lot of the tropes of stock, uh, including layering on a Kenzo watermark. So I'm gonna show that. So, um, but then in uh, 2011, we received a Rhizome grant to create um, disimages.com. Um, and um, essentially, it's a platform for stock imagery that can be applied for both commercial and art contexts. Um, so, we invited um, artists to create work that was um, a kind of a stock extension of their own practice. Um, this sparked um, Disimage Studio, which was kind of a, it was a month long assembly line of um, image production at the Suzanne Geist Gallery, where every day a, di a different person was shooting in the gallery space. Um, we wanted to expand on the situations and lifestyles that are um, not yet purchasable for com not yet available for commercial pur purchase. Often there's kind of a mixture of Sky Mall catalogs, aspirational. Oops. Hello. Oh. Aspirational lifestyles. Um, and art references. Um, we're interested in um, manipulating the idea of a stock image being kind of a code without a message um, by allowing messages to seep into the equation and while still maintaining its status as a multi-purpose image commodity. We like the idea that the same image could be used by a pharmaceutical company um, as by a curator. Um, on disimages, you can search terms like immateriality or 
post medium and often and after one non-transferable download the, they're yours to exhibit you don't have to ask the artist galleries um, in the end the products at disimages.com are 100% um, the work of the artist but we're able to sell uh, royalty free unlimited digital files um, of them for commercial editorial and art usage but each artist took a really different approach um, this is um, Andrew Norman Wilson's stock fantasy ventures, which are proposals for images and videos. Um, and so if a third party decides to buy this image, um, they negotiate a price uh, for the actual production of what the image is describing, uh, which goes back to disimages.com once the image is produced. And then in this case, it was, all, it was videos. So we actually, he did, he sold one and they produced it. And it's a set of like 20 videos that then went back onto disimages.com. Um, and then the person who funded the original um, uh, receives royalties from future sales. Um, this is um, by an artist, Ian Chang, who used 3D motion capture software called FaceShift um, to create avatars of models, in this case, of fashion models. And once you buy the file, they, they are programmable to smile, laugh, frown, or say anything that you want them to say. You can program, it's through the program. Um, it's not an image or a video, so um, I'm gonna show like a tiny clip. No, thank you. Debit or credit? Cash only. This is not safe. This is not safe for work. Congratulations. Happy New Year. Happy birthday. Follow me. Come back, there's only a rash. I'm ready. Um, this is a series that we titled The New Wholesome, which employs many codes and um, conventions of stock, like repetition of symbols and archetypal characters. Um, the situations in situations that aim to communicate a really singular idea. Um, we looked at stock databases for the word wholesome and took the related tags like vegetables or appliances or mothers, prosperity, and we mix them in different ways. Um, seeing how far we could push the associations of the word wholesome um, till they kind of, till their sort of neutrality imploded. Um, the images, stock images represent potential. Um, and we love the idea of images turning up in surprising places. Um, here is a disimage that was used on a modesty swimwear site to sell these um, modesty bathing suits. Um, so in this case, you know, it's kind of no longer a code without a message. It's taken on meaning and utility in, uh, in this context. Um, with mo but with most of the purchases on the site, we actually don't know where they're going or who bought them, um, which we actually find pretty exciting. Um, and overall, we kind of, we, we aim to infiltrate Google image searches with these. Um, thank you, that's it. Thank you so much, uh, David and Solomon. It's also wonderful that there is uh, the continuation to 89 plus because this did the discreet for the 89 plus project when uh, Simon Caste and I invited them uh, as part of the Serpentine uh, Rebaudengo collaboration to launch this grant for young 89 plus artists. You can see that online. Um, and that's maybe also one thing just to mention about these panels. The DLD uh, is such a great incubator, so every year something starts here, and then for the rest of the year and longer, these projects usually evolve. So with 89 Plus, which we started exactly one year ago here, um, there are now many different incarnations. There was the Serpentine Marathon we have next week in Zurich. Uh, the Luma, in two weeks, the Luma Foundation poetry uh, event, where we have the whole 89 plus generation connected to poetry uh, and so on. So there are many different projects uh, coming up and you can see that online on the 89 plus website, but also on the Discrete um, uh, website. It's my great, great pleasure to now introduce our next speaker. 
uh, Joe Herkin. Joe uh, has more than 20 years of tech and publishing sector uh, experience, and um, we were having a wonderful conversation earlier today with him about preset publishing and post-set uh, publishing, um, his ability to lead companies from the startup and growth phase and then beyond. Uh, Joe began working with Issue in early 2013 and brings a lot of Silicon Valley experience in that. And when we were speaking with Steffi Czerny, together with Kevin, preparing this panel, Kevin, Ke Steffi said it's incredibly urgent for preset and post-set to talk to Joe. So a very, very warm welcome to Joe Harkin. Thank you. Good evening. Creative, thoughtful, provocative. These are all terms that I think we would use to describe DLD, right? In our time here, the people we're meeting and the kinds of ideas we're talking about. But often what we're up to here at DLD can be challenging to communicate back to our friends, colleagues, family, wherever we happen to come from. So one of the things that's possible, how many of you have seen this DLD magazine? So we now have the ability to take this magazine, and not only can you start to share the ideas that are available, but you can start to share Steffi across the digital landscape. Content can be embedded in uh, Facebook. You can be tweeting it. We can take this digital version and make it available to engage with across any digital device, any digital experience at any time. What we're starting to see increasingly in the world of publishing is taking traditional print content and making it available for people to consume and monetize across any digital landscape. And we at Issue are really driving a lot of this engagement here. I just lost my... So Issue is a massive digital publishing and discovery and sharing platform that is really focused on helping content find people. So as content is being consumed, we're connecting that content with a massive audience of people who we know have an interest, a passion, an enthusiast around that particular kind of content, covering a whole range of topics and ideas from knitting, surfing, and men's health, and gluten-free cooking ideas, which I find really helpful given that my kids are gluten-free. An issue is on a massive scale. We serve 80 million unique visitors, 5 billion page views every single month. Readers who are reading a, an issue digital publication on any given platform, once they're reading three pages, are spending 21 and a half minutes per visit engaging in that content and discovering more and additional content. If you put every single digital magazine newspaper catalog that's available on the issue platform, if you stacked it all together, it would be over 15 miles worth of content. We're adding 20,000 new publications every single day, all of which can be shared, embedded, and made available to consumers anywhere. It's a global audience throughout Europe, the US, Latin America. And really what we're seeing, this groundswell, is moving from the notion of search, where if you were to go search on longboarding, you'll get a Wikipedia entry. If you're into longboarding, you can actually, in many cases, write that entry yourself. What we're doing is we're understanding every element within the content, the people who are consuming and reading it, and facilitating discovery of content. So the content is driving what you're going to be consuming next, both in terms of the topics, the pages, and also who else in, uh, that's re read this kinds of content is reading similar kinds of content as well. And I think we're in this really new groundswell shift around discovery of digital consumption. In many cases, we're seeing a long form, a renaissance of long form content consumption. And a lot of it is being driven through what I like to call beacon publishers, these publishers that we all know, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, that are giving us little bite-sized beacons, flashes that say, hey, you ought to be interested in this. And now consumers are able to dig deeper into anything that they see, a quick little soundbite or a quick little image or a quick little idea. They can start to go deeper and deeper into content that they're most passionate about across uh, any topic that they have enthusiasm for. 
So again, issue works because what we're focusing on is this emerging trend of coming back to content being king. At the end of the day, it's about connecting an audience to the content itself. And what we're seeing increasingly is the creation of an ecosystem, very similar to what YouTube was. If you all remember back 10 years ago when YouTube was just getting started, lots of people had video content. But it was really hard to do anything with it digitally. YouTube came along and with one click you could start to share, share that content, make it available, embed it, make it accessible. We're seeing that kind of thing happen in SoundCloud. We're seeing this uh, Amazon has completely changed the way in which people are consuming, searching and discovering for books and additional products. And Issue's doing the exact same thing with all digital content, with all print content, moving it into the digital world for distribution and access. I believe we're right now in the moment of what I like to call a Gutenberg moment. Right? Gutenberg did two things. He put a lot of monks out of work, and he launched an entire new era of possibility and new ideas. And I think the, the phones that we're holding in our hands, the iPads, the Android devices, are now facilitating access to content where that content can start to become the center of possibility for us. We can discover new content to read. We can be sharing it with friends. We can be buying products that we're seeing and looking at. This year, over one billion Android-powered devices are going to be sold, and over 300 million iOS devices are going to be sold. We are now in a position in the world, across the globe, where there are a whole new range of ways to serve, share, and make content available. So those are sort of the core things that I wanted to share and talk about in terms of what issue is powering, and hopefully that sets the scene for some of the kind of things we want to chat further about today, too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Baron Radic, who, as Steffi Sterny tells us, is the guru of post-sets and a local resident of Munich. He is a professor of informatics and member of the Emeritai of Excellence group of the Technische Universität, Universität uh, München. His current activities are in real-time image sequence understanding for applications in robotics, sports, driver assistance systems, and online analysis of human facial expressions to classify emotions. Um, and among the many, many things he's done, uh, in, in 1988, he created and directed the uh, Bavarian Research Center for Knowledge-Based Systems and uh, has cooperated in many projects with about 100 Bavarian and international companies. So thank you, Bernd. Um. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin, uh, for this introduction. Thank you for inviting, yeah. uh, inviting me to this panel. Uh, Steffi uh, had the idea to talk about presets and postsets, uh, not from an artist uh, uh, point of view, but from a scientific uh, researcher point of view. So I'm surrounded by, by artists and uh, art, art distributors. I feel, I feel a little bit alone, but uh, uh, both Kevin and uh, um, uh, will help me to to survive. Um, I uh, I came in contact with art from from the painting point of view. 1995 uh, went together with uh, um, with. Uh, Mm. Hmm? No. <laughs> yeah, no, no, not not, not Fargi. <clears throat> it was um, a, a, a first uh, one of the first computer painters. I I find the name in a moment. Uh, first computer painters where we organized a symposium on uh, natural science and art in in Leipzig and what I tried to. What I try to pre present is uh, um, a little bit of work which we had in those days, we did in those days, and the development of uh, development of uh, the, the research uh, in this direction. Ah. 
So what we did in, in those days in the application for robot navigation, we, we became interested in, in chairs, in the, in the environment, in the lab environment. And so the task of one of my team members was to find, to localize these chairs in pictures uh, we had taken. He did it by uh, 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 selecting modules, algorithms, programs from the toolbox, the combining them in different combinations, selected the right parameter values for these modules, then tested and evaluated uh, the result. And you see um, intermediate results in uh, the next the right image, uh, uh, segmentation of this uh, uh, chair image in meaningful uh, parts of, of uh, regions, uh, taking the uh, photos from different uh, directions and at least ar arriving at a, uh, from the iconic description of the surrounding to a symbolic, a qualitative, quantitative description, uh, uh, the result where the chair is. The pure guy needed about three years to develop uh, somehow a reliable and, and uh, a correct program to find objects in uh, 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 Roberta images for navigation of these robots. What I then started is a research project on doing some of these, part of this process automatically. What has to be done is of course to, to formulate the task in a, a more formal way that the computer is understanding what he has to do, but then all the rest can be done automatically, so having a tool set, a preset, a tool set which uh, you can use uh, with fa fabricated programs, with modules, you can uh, select and combine and parameters to, to set and so on. And then to, uh, to test and evaluate these results on uh, pictures you have uh, uh, avail available, for instance, uh, in this scenario, to robot scenario, to uh, to catch uh, to uh, caps from from the shelf, we have a camera for this uh, uh, exaggerating a little bit the quality of the camera. It was a, it's a noisy camera just to, just to, to understand uh, how the process works. The, um, to convert the transformed in the image into edge, uh, edges uh, and from the edges to find out some strong edges which might be uh, 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 defining the, the caps on, on the shelf. And this is, of course, this is far from, far, uh, far from uh, perfect. Um, if you exchange a, 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 a certain filter to a, from a mean filter to a median filter, the result is much more be better, and you see that uh, you can localize uh, the uh, cups in uh, the res resulting image. I should. Some of this. Ah, yeah. No, it's, it's running. So now this, uh, this uh, expert system generates uh, a really, really a, re a huge set of programs, in this case uh, with uh, some uh, selection of about um, less, than, less than 10 operators, less than 10 modules, and uh, invents uh, 359,000 programs. Um, it, uh, uh, among them about 500 valid programs, and then these programs are uh, evaluated, and so see the, the configuration of the programs in the upper part of the uh, movie and the, the results, hopefully. Oh, yeah. In the lower part, so from time to time, you see um, intermediate results of a certain uh, a variation, a certain kind of program, and uh, at the end, the best program with the best quality uh, really 
uh, is able to to select the regions where where cups are. So this is this is a little bit uh, tedious, but uh, what the combination is that uh, both in science and the art we search in images for important uh, or essential observations, and we analyze what we are seeing and concentrate uh, um, on description and vi visualize the but going uh, change to another description, other uh, problem, um, one of the problems we use then to, to tackle is uh, the uh, analysis of facial expressions in order to find about, uh, about the emotional state of uh, uh, the persons, and in this case, the task was to uh, measure the enjoy of driving from uh, of sports cars uh, driven by three different um, uh, drivers, test drivers, and you see we selected the most uh, expressive, the most important uh, parts of the uh, images of the drivers, and were able to. Uh, classify the facial expressions in uh, uh, emotions and the strength of these uh, emotions and at the end the result was that uh, this car was the, the car which has uh, which generates the most uh, fun in driving this uh, kind of sports car With a sensor for a black movie. Okay. <clears throat> so then, the last, uh, nearly the last example, is a, a robotic uh, application for human um, robot dialogue. The same idea is that you can uh, um, make a dialogue only real, realistic, and vivid if the robot understands. Uh, the emotion of his uh, human partner. <coughs> ah. <coughs> so, in the camera eyes of this robot, we have a, a pro program which uh, analyzes the facial expression of uh, his uh, human partner and uh, tries to react in a uh, realistic way, show emotions, tries to react to the dialogue uh, the person is, is uh, doing. So my message for this uh, panel is uh, that in science and art we should exchange techniques and tools uh, and to, to transport the messages uh, uh, that uh, to really change the world. Uh, I have brought these last words from uh, talk uh, this early afternoon from uh, Tony Ferndal. And the last ending is a, a project we have done with uh, Harun Faruqi. Uh, we had uh, videos from the football game of the uh, final of uh, uh, 2006, uh, France and um, Italy. And Taro asked me if he can somehow process the images from uh, this uh, uh, final to to describe what is happening. And what he did is taking these images and uh, our description and making a, an installation with, uh, on 12 screens and showing in, in synchronous at the same time from, from the other original images, the um, uh, visualization of our results, uh, uh, the, the coaches, the, uh, uh, the all of what was, what, was, uh, what was happening in, in this uh, 
environment in the context of this final game. And it was at the Documenta in uh, Castle, this uh, installation the, uh, the first time, was, I think it was rather successful. So I think I have to thank you for your patience. Well, thank you very, very much. And as Steffi said, you are the guru and great inspiration of this idea of, uh, of the post set. But also, you gave us earlier this afternoon a lovely motto, join pre and post of science and art to really change the world. And that brings us back uh, to art and to filmmaking. And um, I wanted to bring in Jason Vishnu. You all met Jason earlier uh, tonight with John Brockman. And, uh, Jason is the filmmaker behind the TED Talks, which have been watched over one billion times, and he's working now on his own uh, documentary films. And Jason, I was wondering if there's anything maybe you wanted to pick up from what was said on the panel, but also maybe relaying to the very last remark of Ryan Tricart in, in his talk earlier on, where he was talking about his unrealized project and how you know it connects to presets and postsets. It would be great to hear what all of that means for, for your practice as a, as a filmmaker. Yeah. Well, aside from this conversation here, we were all talking about this right before we got on stage. And I'll go really fast because I think we started late. And this could easily run on for two hours. But I know we're going to try and, and wrap it up in, in only a few minutes. So in our conversation about presets and postsets, just the terminology sounded, you know, provocative and, and potentially confusing, you know, whether a preset is just, you know, something you might apply to something in advance, you know, like a setting that you could have in Instagram was, you know, the perfect example that came up from, from before, and that goes out to the world and this filter is on it, but, you know, the post set could be this thing that could change later, and, you know, the, the first thing that I thought of when we were debating what does a post set mean be, before Bern arrived <laughs> to join our conversation was, you know, there's, there are light field cameras now where you can shift focus after you've already taken the picture, and a lot of people are talking about this as the future of photography. Or with, within the world of filmmaking, there are now new 3D animation tools where you can design a scene while you're running through it, almost like playing a video game, and that can look like a high-quality movie scene rather than doing all this detailed work after the fact, which is what I'm used to in the world that I work in. Or there's always like revisionist history and just like a government stepping in and, or a corporation stepping in and saying, that didn't really happen, this is what happened. That to me is like the ultimate example of a post-set. Well, again, as always, to bring it back to Ryan, um, we, I think, have more clips uh, that you wanted to explain, sort of some specific examples uh, of how you've included presets in your work or responded to this idea in various ways? Um, so, okay, the, the first clip that we're gonna show is from the end of a movie called Sibling Topics, and it's a conversation between a character named Mass Major and Cedar. Um, they're sort of squatting in a timeshare that's, um, the concept is that it's more of a people are accessing this vacation agency to sort of squat experiences and premises. Um, and in this one, they're having this conversation in which Cedar sort of decides that um, he wants to become, stay in a state of potential energy. And so uh, I use the word as if, so, as a noun, or the phrase as if, as a noun. And, and I think that the way it relates to presets and postsets is kind of, and the idea of wanting to be um, something that is carved out by other people's tools. Because I think a lot of the characters in the work try to exist as framing devices rather than content. And they let content interact with their frames. And in this one, a character is trying to be only potential. So, we can play clip one. I 
I'm sick of all of my outfits coming from default closet. I want to design my own clothes. Mass, I just found a really cool new old phone. I think it's my father figure. What? I love being in places that mean nothing to me. Like this one, nothing to me. It's a family vacation house. You know? What's that? I don't know what that's what that is. Shut up, Cedar. How do we get out of here? If I tried to make dinner, it would just be bad tasting potential energy. Notice I'm not in the kitchen. Shut up, Cedar. How do we get out of here? I smell adolescent fuck faces. They obviously keep them in here. So what, Max? You're always so Look, you're going. Cedar, 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 Cedar. Speaking of Brett and how we're gonna hang her from her foot, which is happening. Work habit. Enable it. Maz, I'm just thinking. Have you ever dated some ever without a body? Wanna try some? I wonder what our kids will look like. Finally! finally. I'm finally just an as if. Sense me now. Cedar, my advice to you is you complicate outfit. Just you want too much. And what you want is vague and you don't work towards it. What? Fuck you, Maz! Don't confront me in my space that I brought us to with my plans. And so the next clip that we're going to show is um, from a movie called Center Jenny, in which uh, there's this character, like um, there's these different, it takes place inside of a gaming system where people are studying humans as if they no longer exist. And the recent past is treated like its ancient ancestry. And so they're investigating like the first level, which is basic Jenny. And it's um, all of these sort of sorority girls casted as like a human element. And the preset component comes in in the sound design. Uh, in the movie, there's kind of this background idea that um, there's like smart soundtrack that kind of like advertises and articulates and pushes forward uh, somebody's dialogue and makes it kind of feel like a pitch or an ad. And so it combines like royalty free or things associated with different ringtones or different aspects of culture into like what people are saying and they kind of get like locked into like musical loops. So we can play the second clip. All right. The only thing I'll ever study is human era hazing and how significant and awesome it is. Like, why don't we haze people? The humans were so cool. Sup, let me be my girls. Sup. <laughs> And then the last clip is from a movie called Romy View. And this movie, I, I bought a certain uh, stock 
um, video portfolios. And although people, you know, try to create like a very like neutral content when they're making stock images, they, um, if you look at their whole portfolio, there tends to be kind of like a narrative component that you end up inserting. And at towards the end of this clip, it's like three minutes long. There's uh, uh, some some actual stock moments, but the scene is also sort of taking a name, which is Katie, and treating it as like a vibe, and so like a person being a preset. And I think that there's, whether people are consciously doing it or not, I think that people are starting to think of behaviors and types as presets in culture, and are think of themselves as outside of everything, and they're like framing it and cropping it and commenting on it. And even though they're a part of it, I feel like there's this tendency to look at it as if it's supplies. And so this kind of relates to that. And you can play the third clip. Thanks. No, last time you cut it long. This time cut it short. They don't know you, John. They're not going to say anything about you. Don't touch me ever again. It's something that I already know I don't want to make. Do you see me packing? me ever again oh i'm sorry i can tell they like me i can tell the same things Stop. i'm katie i want you to cut my hair i'm going to cut your hair john because it ends well they're so cute john it's mad touch me touch me touch me for me lance did they talk about me yet Cut my hair shorter. I like that kind of person. But it already started short. I don't care. I want it shorter. I want it to basically be nothing. A bug. You could totally what? Oh, no. I told you I could totally kill them. kind of out of time. <laughs> Brian, thank you very, very much. And I now um, wanted to ask Steffi to tell us a few words. We are incredibly grateful to Steffi for everything. And we really need a very special applause to Steffi, the hero. <laughs> you. And it's fascinating because last year we had many conversations with uh, with Kevin and many of the participants about Ryan's work, about presets, and all of a sudden Steffi entered the room and she said post sets. So Steffi, can you tell us a little bit about your epiphany of the post sets? 
the, the, harmo the harmony of the presets and the process is seeing sitting you like a boy group at a stage. I mean, with this enormously colors, this pink of Peter, this yellow of I um, of you, Ryan, and the brown cor corduroy from you. I, I like this composition. This is real preset and proset and preset and postset and uber set. Thank you so much for this super panel. I'm, I'm really touched. I'm, I could hear you forever. Um, and I'm, I'm really sad that nobody's, not, that it's empty. These are the specialists. Everyone, should we, next time we put it in the middle of DLD. I think you're a really inspiring group and let's go on with this next year. Okay? <laughs> So we've got some time. And I love the, you know, um, I love this Los Angeles Bavarian touch we have here. <laughs> Los Angeles, New York, Bavaria, Munich, Kreut. <laughs> That's good. such a great point. You know, Pontus Hulten did these shows like Paris, Moscow, Paris, New York. Um, and there were really the great shows about the early 20th century avant-garde, which, which, you know, with which he launched the Centre Pompidou as the founding director. And now, we have Munich LA, it's yeah. the new access. Perfect, and you know, it's really, I have to say it, here in Munich, maybe you don't know it, um, Kandinsky invented abstract art. Remember, Blauer Reiter, Blue, I don't Reiter, it was here in this very town, with this building, in this building where we sit right now, it's a palace, it's a Bavarian aristocrat's palace. I'm sure that Kandinsky, Klee, all this, Yavlensky, they passed a little, they went here up and down, like you now. Isn't it a good match? <laughs> a weird match. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, it's a moment uh, yeah, for questions, and we still have some time, because <clears throat> I promised it will not be a marathon like last year, where we were here almost until midnight. But um, we still have time for some questions. I was wondering, you know, because Kevin and I have now asked lots of, you know, questions. We've also introduced you all, but maybe there are some comments among each other, or there are some threads to pick up. Um, I have a question. Uh, great uh, films, I admire really, but uh, the one question remains, where did you get this, those people from <laughs> where? Um, uh, they're all friends and peers, people I know. Some of them, there's, some of them are actors, but just people. <laughs> but uh, that's not what anyone's, any, they're, they're all acting or channeling or something, so they're not, it's not them. Um, I have a question for Ryan, and it's um, in a cl class I took in college. We watched A Family Finds Entertainment, and I remember, I'll never forget, um, the, there's a moment in it, um, for those of you who haven't seen it, where there's uh, somebody's dead in the street, and there's all this commotion around it, and people are filming it, people are calling each other, saying, oh my god, there's this girl that's dead in the street, and it strikes me as really interesting because um, that film was written and filmed before the age of smartphones, if I'm correct. And I was just wondering um, if you've thought about now that we um, all have iPhones and Instagram and, and Vine and all these things, if that concept of sort of witnessing versus participating, how that figures in now, you think, um, since smartphones are such a big thing? Well, I, th I think that the the way um, the movies are shot, I think makes a lot more sense now. Like I don't get questions about it anymore because people are used to these uh, handheld type camera angles. Um, just like the selfie is kind of like a, 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 usually people do it up or like low and that's a camera angle that was used in the early films a lot. And also just, yeah, yeah, basically videotaping everything. But I, uh, I think that, yeah, I think, I think the content has changed completely. And because of that, like the way that movie reads is very different now than it did before uh, YouTube and uh, smartphones being like widespread. 
Do we have other questions or comments? What do you think? Um, I just wanted to ask, I, I see many uh, videos on YouTube, uh, but I did not understand your videos. Uh, I don't know, um, even not with your explanation, I, I couldn't uh, figure it out. <laughs> do you get this a lot or do you, uh, or how do people react to, to, to your videos normally? Yeah, that happens. Uh, I mean, I think that they're, they're supposed to be unpacked and experienced differently over time. Like, first, I think time reading it is much more about writing it. So, I don't know. But I, I think they, they make more sense in a larger context of, of watching the whole thing. So, but they're not there. You're, I also encourage people to just watch parts of it. So. But also with the sound, I think it was hard to hear the words. You, with headphones or a different room, you would be able to hear the language a little bit more. Are there other questions? I thought this afternoon there was a lot of discussions with this about <laughs> your sort of view on presets, postsets. Maybe it's nice to have a sort of after comment. I don't know, we were talking a little bit about um, when we came up, when we started this images, um, the website, we wanted to kind of like, you know, we wanted to drastically expand what, um, what was out there as a stock image in terms of like uh, connecting different tags. And when we were discussing um, the idea of post sets, it brought back this idea that we had had where we wanted to figure out a way that you could just continually add or take away tags in the image. I mean, this is a theoretical kind of, you know, and then, like, let's say it was um, um, lesbian drinking coffee, and you wanted to add um, sad, and suddenly she was sad, and you can kind of, like, these infinite possibilities of um, the way that these tags can come together is something that we kind of wanted to remix and create. Um, so that was just one thing in terms of the post-its, presets, post-its idea that, um, into my hand, uh. Do you have any kind of unrealized projects? I mean, Ryan was mentioning, you know, in relation to the topic, his unrealized projects of filming in a specific way. Are there any kind of unrealized these projects? That, that's kind of an unrealized project. I mean, <laughs> um, but yes, I don't know. We have a, we do have a lot of unrealized projects. I, I can't think of it. No, well, we're constantly sort of moving on to the next project, also, but. Um, yeah. Maybe it's interesting to uh, have our auto filmmaker talk about unrealized projects. Uh, unrealized projects? Yeah. Well, I mean, I was talking, I was talking about unrealized projects earlier because they're all still works in progress. Um, but I feel like we should, I should thank everyone on the panel for being, I mean, there, there may be more questions to come up, but like right now, yeah. I feel like um, this has been really interesting hearing what everyone is up to right now. Maybe a last uh, point to bring it back uh, to technology. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily have an unrealized project as much as an un, uh, unrealized idea. Uh, one of the things that I'm hoping we get to is no longer people asking the question, what's the best content, but recognizing that the quote unquote best content is that content which means something and matters to the person who's consuming it, reading it, looking at it, and creating it. And that we can uh, define best by the moments in which that content is being interacted with. Thank you. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us here. Uh, Uh, what do you actually think about VJing or live uh, video mixing, Ryan? VJing or live video mixing? I mean, uh, videotaping came from an age where uh, digital video mixing live wasn't really possible or only with uh, very expensive equipment, but we here have huge screens and, and uh, live video 
Yeah, I, 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 I'm really interested in it. I think that, I mean, that relates to the post-set and pre-set ideas in general, but I feel like one of the potential forms movies could take is, it, you know, is tools where you can sort of like have a live experience with the movie. So it's not, not necessarily like a game, but you know, laying out ways for people to create content from the, from the form of the movie itself, which I think is like a kind of live video mixing in a way. But, um, but I also like where the, uh, the shoots that we've been doing recently, where you've made like a sound stage where, and there's a whole bunch of cameras. And so the, and we've been bringing a lot of the post work into like more of a live sort of state. Um, Cause more, I'm working with some of my friends that do animation and like Rhett LaRue and, and we're trying to like, we're slowly bringing it into the process in real time. But we can talk more about it afterwards. So, cool. Anything any of our speakers want to add? Or? Pizza or? <laughs> Good, yeah, we have a question here from I just want to thank you, Professor Radik, because um, of showing this or making happening the, that football, soccer video art with Haran Faruqi, because this is one of the most underestimated techniques or devices you added to that, and it was one of the most popular artworks ever at Documenta. So, this was an example for me that also uh, elder generation can add something to that field. No, it's indeed a fantastic uh, achievement and it's wonderful that you mentioned that because also what it shows is that when you know, art and technology can come together, one plus one can be 11 and that great things can be, be realized. That it somehow, actually your, your great remark brings something we somehow forgot to, to maybe ask, and I know we're running out of time, but I think we should somehow um, uh, raise that issue, which is, you know, Ryan was telling us about his unrealized project, and uh, this were uh, alluding to an unrealized project, and I'm sure we're gonna hear later, hopefully, about one of Jason's, you know, unrealized films. I was wondering if our, you know, technologists on the panel, and it's of course a question to Bernd, because Gabi brought him up in relation to to Harun Faroki, but it's a question also to Joe and to Peter, if there is anything in the field of technology you see, you know, to make Ryan's and this unrealized project possible. Maybe some new collaboration could emerge. Is closing up on humans, if you will. So I think we're getting better and better tools to express ourselves. And so you can see that uh, essentially for every generation of technology that comes, not just in computing, but, but really specifically in computing, everything from you know, wearable computing to, to interfaces that allow us to express ourselves, without having to know a specific programming language. These are things that will enable people to, I think, uh, really uh, express the full color of, uh, and palette of Im imagination that humans have. And uh, I, I think we've seen some wonderful examples of that today and we'll continue to see more and more of that. I think we should all talk about our unrealized projects at the closing party later tonight. That sounds okay. great. <laughs> Thank you all very much. We are very grateful to Ben, to David, to Jason, to Joe, to Peter, to Ryan, to Solomon, of course, to Steffi, uh, Yossi, and, 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 and Hubert. I would like also to very specially thank here Melissa Faber-Castell for the amazing organization of the whole Posted exhibition, the amazing team of DLD for the incredible uh, 
organization and all of you for being here with us tonight. Thank you all so much.